exposés and poor financial and accounting practices, the public sector auditing was just plain pitiful. It was, it was terrible. I remember one time when my firm was auditing a county that had previously been audited by just a, a one-man, single, non-certified accountant for many, many years. And I arrived with my briefcase to start the audit. And uh, the lovely little lady who had been the treasurer of the county for many decades uh, opened up on a big table. She opened up two gigantic books. One was a cash receipts book with multi columns across about 30 or 40 columns on each side and the, and the, and the, and the, cash, the cash receipt book and the cash disbursement book. And uh, she had very carefully and very legibly, very excellent writing, had entered everything during the past year. So I looked at the, at the first page or two and, and I turned to her and I said, I said, ma'am, you know, we, we used, back in those days, we used the word ma'am too in the South. Uh, so I feel at home here. Ma'am, there's no totals in these books. There's no totals in these books. They haven't been added up. And she very pertly said, but Mr. Westbury, that's what our auditor does. So that so-called auditor was just adding up the columns and summarizing the receipts and disbursements, and that was all. He was not verifying anybody. Well, later in the second largest county in my state, uh, we followed another auditing firm in, an old-fashioned, very old auditing firm in as new auditors. And when we looked for the general ledger, we were told that the senior partner of the former auditing firm always carried it around in his briefcase. So he was the only one that had any information about the county and he always had it in his briefcase. Finally, when I really hit the big time, auditing the largest county in the state, I had to spend two years designing and installing an accounting system so we'd have something to audit. I can tell you that the government auditing profession in the U.S. and the world has really come a long way since those days. And incidentally, so has the financial management profession in both the private and the public sectors. But sadly, we do not seem to have made nearly as much progress in strengthening internal controls in business and government that work to protect public resources. While back in the middle of the 20th century, we were able to perform many tests of records and rely upon our results and the strength of internal controls the, the most important controls we really rely on were those controls imposed by the character of the individuals, along with long-standing long separation of functions and other control procedures. And that is no longer the case. Controls once fairly routine and not so severe have had to be strengthened over the past five decades several times due to flagrant cases of business corruption and scandal. Worse yet, there are more and more cases of executive override of controls combined with large-scale large scale collusion among executives and employees. Something unheard of in the days when I was a young auditor. The major auditing firms have been embarrassed time and time again in recent years by scandalous corrupt practices that their clients have performed, that they themselves at times have condoned in frantic efforts to retain trust with the clientele. One of the most famous, of course, occurred just here in India not too long ago, and you're, I'm sure most of you may be familiar with it. In my opinion, as a CPA, for the last 53 years, the problem lies not so much in technical accounts and information technology areas as in human areas. Let me hasten to say it's not just a problem in the United States or any other particular country. It's a worldwide problem. Talk about globalization. Corruption is the most globalized thing on earth. <coughs> it's exacerbated by forces and factors that reach almost beyond the power of the human race to control. But here I need to stop preaching and get back to some cases from the past in hopes that we might learn something to help us in the future. Here's a, 
a case from my own experience. In the decade of the 1950s, parallel this to the case in the Philippines right now. Listen and, and see if you see the parallel. In the decade of the 1950s, a number of scandals broke out in the administration of the state of Georgia. They were, they were investigated by local authorities and highly publicized in the media. In November 1958, a new governor, Ernest Handover, was elected, promising to clean up corruption. Unlike well, many politicians, he was serious about it. He established the criminal division in the Attorney General's office, which was a call, well, then, it, and then it still is called the State Law Department of Georgia. But there was a secret provision to setting it up. It reported directly to the governor and not to the Attorney General who was a separately elected official who had held in office for many years and who was not trusted by the governor. He was willing to accept this peculiar arrangement because politically he was not in a position to investigate and prosecute the people who had been his friends for many years. So the criminal division was set up under a career assistant attorney general with a sterling record of professional character and ethics who sometimes, some years later, was named to high state and federal judgeships. Its small staff was composed of three retired ex-FBI agents. The FBI agents retired about age 40, so they weren't too old. Its small staff was composed of those three ex-FBI agents, a young 25-year-old CPA, and two secretaries. The criminal division lost several investigations, but principally it concentrated on corruption in the previous administration of former governor Marvin Griffin, the main, Marvin Griffin, the main object objective of its creation. During 1959 through 61, there were many more news reports about alleged corruption involving the former governor's administration, his friends, family, and cronies, but especially his brother, his brother Cheney Griffin, who was eventually prosecuted for accepting monthly checks that were controlled, that were alleged to be bribes from a tractor dealer who practically controlled all public tenders and procurements of tractors by the state through blatant fraudulent practices. The dealer finally accepted his fate under, under investigation and very reluctantly turned state's evidence at the trial of the governor's brother. However, through the efforts of the state's most brilliant, astute, and theatrical defense attorney, the jury failed to convict the former governor's brother. With his brother exonerated, even though he was besmirched by many other charges of corruption, ex-governor Griffin who retained a great popularity due to his colorful populist stances and promises and had maintained a powerful political machine, he immediately began a campaign to be elected to a second term as governor and he was the strongest candidate. His main opponent, Carl Sanders, campaigned on an anti-corruption platform, emphasizing all the scandals reported by the criminal division and the media. His speeches including tossing out to the crowds uh, at, at political rallies, actual check-sized photocopies of the tractor dealer's checks to Cheney Griffin. As a result, Marvin Griffin lost the 1962 Democratic primary, and that ended his political career. But despite the strong and successful anti-corruption campaign, Sanders did not retain the criminal division for the state law department. When local newspapers launched the campaign, for its restoration. Now Governor Sanders rejected the idea and said it wasn't needed. And when a state senator proposed a bill to reestablish the criminal division, it was rejected overwhelmingly by the legislature. The criminal division